while I was growing up, I was full of angst. I was a mess. I was volatile and abrasive and reactionary and violent at times. And I hid it pretty well for a while, but I had this deep emptiness inside of me and this jumble that needed to come out. And I finally made the decision to pursue filling my heart and my soul instead of trying to fill my bank account and fill my home. And when this jumble got released, I finally felt like I could be seen and feel like I could see for the first time. Sorry, sorry about that. That's serendipity right there. <laughs> My name is William Massey, and I bring the divided things together. I'll just run through the video one more time, why not? I bring the broken stuff, the junk, the jumble, the mess into some sort of congruent whole. And I do that with found objects. And I do that with people. And I do that with ambiguous, ethereal ideas. It makes sense of the mess. And some would call that serendipitous. Serendipity. Y'all, like, I strained over this word for like three months. What the heck is serendipity? And I still don't know. I've read the definition, but serendipity. I would like to call this speech not serendipity, but what the heck is serendipity? <laughs> um, as Britt uh, shared, it's basically how random encounters and accidents somehow work together fortuitously. And I think there's some risk in asking a white, male, American, how to talk about how things just magically work out for good. <laughs> so I want to be sensitive to that, and I want to share not just about how everything works out for good, but the struggle and the failures and the rejection that comes along with um, somehow things working out for good. Um, and with that said, I just want to state that from what I've learned and all the various people I've talked to throughout my life, serendipity has no bias, and it requires no prerequisites. And it's not so much about what you have and what you start with as much as it is how you see and embrace what's in front of you. So my question to you is, can you believe that all things, all encounters, all experiences in your life somehow work together for a purpose? I'm not fully convinced, and I'm not speaking with utter certainty here, um, but I have some experiences that I'd like to share um, that will maybe convince me or maybe inspire you um, as I share. And I have these stories um, basically about how I showed up with arms open, ready to experience, how I jumped in without any specific expectations, and how I trusted the long, arduous process, all with a habit of hope underneath. So I'll pick back up where I left off in my opening mon monologue. I was, um, I was wooed by the world for about 20 years. And it was two and a half years into business and communications classes in college that I realized I'd rather be fulfilled and happy than I would be miserable and rich. And I switched my major to art at that time. It was just this gut impulse. And I was, I was just open and ready and excited. And I, I started being really um, encouraged by school and really intrigued uh, to be challenged and excited by solving problems and trying to get the mess of ideas out into the world. I was fully alive for the first time. And um, during those moments uh, in my first couple semesters, there were a few random occasions that ended up being serendipity. And I'm just going to throw them out there. And they, serendipity is like, it doesn't make sense until you get to the end. So just 
follow me and stick with me for a second, okay? Um, first semester, I was in Valdosta, at Valdosta State University. I was walking down the street by the Fine Arts Building, and there was a guy and a girl in the front yard. And I beelined it right over to him, and I introduced myself. Jenny, where are you? Jenny. It was Jenny and her boyfriend at the time, now husband. And I just, I don't, I just felt this, oh, I'm just going to meet them. Um, a few weeks later, she recognized me and um, invited me to learn how to blow glass for uh, basically a, a work exchange. I would help, and he would teach. And uh, I just fell in love with it. I was trying everything else. Why not try glass blowing at the time? Um, during the summers I was away from school, I called up all the glass blowers in Atlanta. In the yellow pages, there were three. <laughs> and one called me back, Matt Janke. And I told him the same thing. I'll work for free if you teach me. I just want to learn. And um, I built a relationship with him, and he took a leap of faith, welcoming me into his studio. Another story. I was alone in the studio, and art was good, and it was changing my life, and I felt this release, and I was finally getting out all the stuff that was stuck in me. But I was like, it's not it. Like, there's something more. I, I feel like I need to impact people somehow positively through my art. And I didn't know how, but later that day, I was driving to the liquor store to get some beer. It was a Friday afternoon, and I was driving by the hospital, and something in me, serendipity in me, turned into the parking lot, walked me into volunteer services, and I showed up. I said, I just want to help people who aren't having a good day, maybe make art with them. And they sent me to the cancer center. And I was terrified every single day, but I showed up, I sat down, and I learned how to love people through creativity. Last story. I was in the studio, and I was, um, I was really anxious because this sculpture I was working on sucked, and I knew it. <laughs> and it was like a, just a jumble mess that was supposed to be a face, and I was like, what the heck is going on? And we were about to have a progress critique, critique with my professor, and just out of desperation, I picked up this rusty tin can. It was all mangled and broken, and I just stuck it in the middle of these big glass spheres, and my Professor and I agreed, that is the most interesting thing about this sculpture. <laughs> and from that moment forward, I was obsessed with the broken. Not the clean and pristine, but the stuff that was wrecked and damaged and had a history and a story to tell. And I started making art out of the wreckage, not out of the beauty, raw materials, clean lines, whatnot. Um, this was my exit portrait. It's kind of a co-portrait of myself and my father. Um, and all that stuff on the left side, that's the beautiful glass spheres that I started out with and whoosh, broke them all. It was great. So I was, I was graduating um, with very little in mind and very little uh, understanding of what was coming next. Um, and it was a couple months before graduation, I was at this juice shop, and I, in, uh, I complimented um, the person behind the counter. They had this beautiful pendant on. And they said, oh, my, my grandma's best friend lives and works in Italy, and he has an art residency program every summer. And he welcomes students there. And I go, I'm going. <laughs> Can I have your grandma's number? <laughs> and two months later, I was in Italy. I had done the residency. Um, the scenery was nice. The residency was difficult, but I said, if I can manage for two months with this, I can handle much more in the future. So I stuck with it. But after a couple months, I was on a rusty bicycle, careening through Tuscany, sleeping in the woods uh, in a hammock, um, wondering if I should have spent $200 on the Buddy Pass one-way flight to go to Italy. I was eating bread and beans and tuna, and I was looking for work wherever I could find it. And I got no and no and no. And maybe at that farm, and they said no. And, but maybe at this meditation commune, and they said no. And someone pointed me to this trail on a mountain and said, there's some rock sculptures. You're an artist. There's no work, but you should go look at those sculptures. And, and I showed up to this trailhead feeling pretty deflated and diffused, depleted. 
and I encountered this man. Manfredo is his name. <laughs> He's a, a German fellow. He's been living in Italy for 30 years. And he said, where are you from? And I said, that's my German accent, I'm sorry. <laughs> he said, where are you from? I said, U USA. He goes, what do you do? I'm an artist. He says, you will work for me. <laughs> and I said, okay. <laughs> Let's start now. Uh, this is a more joyful portrait of him. We found this old door in the dump, and we loved it, and he was excited. Um, and we built a relationship, and he was ordered by the doctor not to carry heavy stones, so I helped him carry the heavy stones and helped him build his big stone sculptures. And we built a relationship, and eventually he said, why don't you make a sculpture here at the sculpture park? And I said, I have no equipment, I have no electricity, I have no ideas. Um, okay, sure. But there was a dump at the bottom of the mountain. Ah. So I started bringing up junk, and this is the midway process. This is part of the process where I'm like, I shouldn't have said yes. <laughs> but I had a habit of hope, and I trusted this part of the process, which every one of you knows is the doubt phase of the process. And I stuck with it, and after two long weeks of scratching my head, there was still a pile of junk on the ground. And as you would go down the trail, you'd have to pass in front of it. And I just wanted to create this moment of discovery for the viewer. So as you passed in front of it, you would see. Manfredo. It was a portrait of my buddy Manfredo. He said he hasn't been feeling very uh, received or heard by the world, and I just wanted to honor him and thank him. Um, and this was great. International travel was great. But uh, I realized after a few months that m my family is more important than adventures. And let's face it, I had no money, and I was in debt after college. So I said I should probably go home to these guys. My imperfect family, so beautiful. Um, there's been one added since this uh, picture was taken. Mom, dad, two sisters, brother-in-laws, six nieces and nephews. I like to say that they make up for my lack of procreation. <laughs> but my art's my baby. So I came home, and I really, I was um, pretty apprehensive about Atlanta. I didn't know anything about it, and I just, it didn't feel very adventurous to me, but I trusted this part of the process where you have to show up, you have to grow roots where you're at and invest. So I came here, called up Matt Janke. I have some free hands. He said, come on. And I started working at the glass studio with Matt. Uh, started helping him out. That's the legend himself. And then um, lo and behold, I run into Jenny again. She goes, hey, have you heard about the Beltline? I was like, no, what's that? She's like, oh, big sidewalk with some art on it. I said... <laughs> I said, I'll try to put some art over there. I, I pitched an idea, and they were like, that's a risky idea, William. You want to put junk on our sculpture and call it art? But I showed them the picture of the random sculpture at the random sculpture park at the random adventure in Italy, and they said, okay, you can try. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my first sculpture over on the belt lines, um, made of glass and junk, glass from Jenkins Glass Studio and it comes together to form a portrait of Matt to, once again, uh, honor someone who took a leap of faith with me and in me. Um, and this was good, and I was trying to kind of unfold um, this, these ideas that I had and make them a little bit more, more firm rather than just like sprawling junk out on the ground. So uh, I tried again next year, and I did this standing sculpture. Um, as just a way to interact with the public and engage the community and get them noticing and having fun with public art. I don't have any other shots of the perspective, so you're just going to have to fill the rest with your mind. But um, there is still something missing. Like, putting art out there and and letting the public enjoy it, that was fun, but like, where is that direct impact? Like, how am I directly, uh, positively influencing and impacting people through my art? And I had this longing in my soul that I just jumped after. And um, I, I started exploring the beautiful organizations in Atlanta 
Um, this is with ageless interaction. Um, the founder, Megan Jane, and I started going to uh, health and hospice homes, and we started an art program at a few of them, and started making art with these isolated, lonely, older adults who had no stimulation and had no, not much interaction. We started bringing life and joy and connectivity in there. And then I started going back to the cancer center. This is at Winship Cancer Center. Um, I founded a program with a couple other artists, and I still had no idea what I was doing, but I sat down with the habit of hope and engaged with people and still do, um, somehow utilizing art to get them through eight hours of chemotherapy and to get them out of their head and out of the worry. Um, draw change, I, I started working with uh, homeless youth and giving them uh, life and awe-inspiring curiosity like they should have at a young age. And there's a list of like 20 more, so I'm sorry if I left anything out. But uh, Remerge is another organization that I um, kind of adopted, and they adopted me, and I fell in love with them. And it's this open community of people from all over, all walks of life. And we come together in the park every Thursday. And we rub shoulders, and we bump elbows, and we make art together. And these cold, divided people uh, who normally wouldn't interact would come together, and they'd goof off and be kids and be community. And uh, I had a series of conversations talking about this community, good community stuff, and then these big ideas that I had, and how could they merge together. So Remerge and I um, dove in and started collecting junk from around the neighborhood, putting it together on metal panels, and painting it. We were just painting over the dirt and the grime and the rust, and we were putting life and personality on the stuff that other people said, that's worthless. Walk over that. Don't worry about that. And we kept at it with the habit of hope. I had no idea how this was coming together. But, uh, but people came together. And people embraced each other and embraced the mess and made it a little bit more beautiful than it was laying on the street. And we kept at it. And we kept at it. Panel after panel, I had this crude map drawn up, and I had no idea. But I had faith that somehow it would come together. And all 12 panels finally got completed over the course of three months. This was the last one. And we built them up and put it under the belt line where my first sculpture had gone a couple years before. And somehow the pieces came together. The junk began to make sense. And that habit of hope paid off to form a portrait of Tony. Two hundred plus people poured into this, with a lot of uh, faith in the unknown. And Tony, the man we're looking at, was homeless for about six years, and he was wayward, and he was forgotten, and he was downtrodden and broken. And he came to this community, and we welcomed him in. And after the sculpture was completed, um, he is now living with his family again, and he's under. Uh, roof again, and he's been reconciled. Now, it's not because of the sculpture, but uh, serendipitously, those, those two things congruently happened. Um, and you just, you don't know the effect of, of when you step out on a leap of faith, where it's going to go, but you just got to trust. Um, now, we put this up. It's a monument of uh, Tony and reconciliation, redemption, community, um, but I didn't know what was going to happen after that. And then I got this random Instagram message that I couldn't quite comprehend, but it had a picture, thankfully. And it was from India. And they had seen this sculpture on Instagram in this class from, I forget where, SH College in Thevara. Thevara? Sorry. I should have practiced that. Um, so they, <laughs> they made this sculpture. Uh, and we're inspired from the entire other side of the world. And I still can't wrap my head around it, but it's cool. And that's serendipity at work. So in wrapping up, I'd like to say that serendipity is easier said looking back. It's easier to comprehend and to recognize and to appreciate when you're in retrospect. 
It's hard to see the dots that are laying ahead and how they're going to connect. And I want to admit that I still don't know what I'm doing, and every single project is just like the one I showed you. And there's no formula to it. But I know that it doesn't happen when you're standing still, and I know it doesn't happen when you're only searching to serve yourself. So, like I said, I can't tell you how to make serendipity happen, but I want to share um, this epiphany I had in the shower about three months before I um, started preparing for this speech. And it goes a little something like this. 8-1880. If you want to create fertile soil for serendipity to grow in your life, remember 8-1880. And that stands for... First, you got to be an eight-year-old. You got to be a kid, y'all. You got to be willing to receive. You got to have curiosity and awe and wonder. You have to know you don't know everything and open yourself up, be willing to learn, and just go and seek. Next, you got to be 18 years old. And for me as an 18-year-old, I know you guys aren't, all aren't me, but I was pretty reckless and unformed in my mind, and I would just jump in without thinking. So don't be too logical. Don't have such strict expectations, and be willing to jump in. And lastly, you got to be 80. You got to be an old man or woman. You got to be chilling. <laughs> you cannot freak out over every little thing, and I struggle with this to this day, till an hour ago. <laughs> but y'all, no matter what happens, you got to remember who you are, what you're made for, that you're a work in progress, and you got to trust that process with a habit of hope. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, William. That was awesome. Thanks, Blake. So good. Thank you. All right. We're going to do a Q&A with William. So if you have any questions, I'll run mics over here. Brittany will run mics over there. Raise your hand, and William will call on you. Uh, but ask your question into the mic so the video has it. Any questions? Hard questions. I don't like them easy. I'm just curious to know what happens to your sculptures after they leave the bottle. That's a great question. Um, the one where you saw the, the uh, kids walking through it, that's in Watkinsville right now. Um, but the temporary exhibition is about to end, so if you need a home, or if it, it needs a home if you got one. Um, the bigger one of Tony is under my porch right now. I was in conversation with, with Emery. Uh, with my fingers crossed, but um, they couldn't quite fit it in their building plan for um, their coming construction. So I'm open. I'm open to things. Uh, I have an exhibit coming up in a, a few months or a year, rather. Um, and if it's still around, it'll go there. Or if you guys have some space for it to go, give me a call. Yeah, I don't think that far ahead. I just know I got to do it. I don't think where it's going to go afterwards. <laughs> And I don't need any more junk. Please, no more. <laughs> I'm okay. Yes? Um, hi. I love your work. Thank you. Um, I was very sad when Tony came down, but I'm glad to see that he's been uh, replaced, and I hope that he soon gets repurposed. I wanted to know... Um, if you ever thought of collaborating with other community artists and how do you see yourself continuing with the community art because we know that art heals and does so many wonderful things. So what, is your, what are your plans? Thank you for that. Good question. Plans, loose expectations. Um, well, I help, I help facilitate a number of art programs around the city at Winship Cancer Center. We just finally got like truly founded as an arts and health program. Um, myself and Amber Gwynn and Matt Evans 
go in there regularly. Um, I work with Mercy Care downtown for weekly art programs. Uh, Tuesday is the Cancer Center, Wednesday is the Gateway Center, Mercy Care, and Thursday with Remerge, engaging open community art sessions. Welcome to all. Um, I do work with other artists, and that's a huge, huge um, piece of my life is interacting and stirring ideas and collaborations with other artists. A few of them are in this room. I mean, a lot of you are in this room. And uh, plans kind of pop up out of nowhere. Um, all I know is I'm here to serve my community and my fellow artists. And um, I wrestled through ideas with them, and they wrestled through ideas with me. And we work with each other all the time. I'm sorry, that's a really ambiguous answer but there's like 40 things on my list that I could go into. Um, maybe I should make a list of all the artists that I know and love and work with and all that they're doing and all that we're doing together. And I'll post it on Instagram. I'm committing. <laughs> questions over here? Any questions over here? Hey, how do you um, kind of balance the, when you're working on a project, um, when you kind of feel the art taking it in a different direction that could be new or exciting, and when to let the art breathe and live, or when to kind of stick to the plan and finish what your goal was? <laughs> well, that was a softball question right there. <laughs> I mean, there is, there is no s protocol. Um, there's this kind of flow for every project of like, this idea, oh, this idea. And then you just barrel through it. Um, like in preparing for this speech, I was excited, excited, and then when it came down for like things to fall in line, I was cringing and clawing for it. And then eventually you just have to be that eight-year-old and just whew, hands open. Um, ready to receive, um, kind of listening. I think Kyle Brooks said, listen to that mysterious voice in your ear. <laughs> and it looks different from day to day and project to project, but it really is just trust and hope and just going forward even though it doesn't make sense sometimes. Yeah. We got one over here in the corner. Hey, Jenny. Hey, Will. <laughs> Thanks again. Yeah, it's <laughs> great. So... You pour so much of your heart into everything you do and all the people you work with. What is your advice for setting boundaries within yourself? So you give so much, but your family is so important. You know, you have to stay strong to be able to help the people you do. How do you balance that? That's a good question. Let me take a sip of water. I mean, you never quite get it right. Um, uh, there's this um, old wise tale that is the American dream that you work, 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 and then you're allowed to rest. And I think that's backwards. Sorry. But I think if you um, begin with rest and you you begin with uh, grace and making sure that you're not being too hard on yourself, which I am sometimes. Um, I mean, self-care is important. Being nice to yourself is important and giving yourself grace that even though you have a million ideas, you're meant to do one now. And though you have a million people in your life, you're meant to engage with a few uh, and it's a constant battle, and I believe it will go on till the day that I die. And then I'll be free. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, you got to feel it out. It's that hope. It's that trust. Uh, it's listening to your gut. You know, sometimes I've got eight meetings, and then someone pops into my head from, like, three years ago, and I'm like, i gotta, I got to hang out with that person now. <laughs> and it doesn't make sense. Um, but, yeah, I get away, and that's important. Um, 
I rock climb at wall crawlers in Candler Park and uh, take long walks with my dogs, like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Lucy, I'm sorry she can't be here with you today. Um, I know she's the real star. Uh, but yeah, self-care. Self-care is really important. Yeah. A few more questions over here. Thanks. Um, I'm sure, I, should I ask now? <laughs> um, I'm sure this is a question that's probably on most people's minds right now, but um, why did you take your shoes off before you began? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I just wanted to be comfortable with y'all. I'm a little bit more comfortable when my shoes are off. So, And Molly said embrace the silence, so uh, by golly, I was not going to come up here and try to fill that silence right away. By golly. <laughs> 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 uh, I, I, I know a lot of uh, archaeologists have looked at this question, but I've, I've, hearing your, your talk made me think of it in particular, the Nazca Lines. Just the Nazca Lines in Peru and... Okay. What, what are your thoughts on them and what they were thinking? You know, because that, you know, talking about a project that you get started on, you, you can't really see much project, pr progress happening. You know, it took, you know, probably a long, long time. What do you think they were thinking? Well, this is a good point of um, <laughs> knowing that you don't know everything. <laughs> the na Nas... Nazca? Oh, I probably learned well, about that in school. The like, same question could be applied to the pyramids or something like that, you know? Okay. W what do you think they were thinking as they... They probably had this weird, like, oh, we just got to do this. Let's try. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All right. Let's give William a round of applause. Come on. Can I come up here? Can I come up? Thanks, everybody, for coming out. This is my son, Banner. Everyone say hi, Banner. Can you say hi? Hey. Can you say thanks for coming? Thanks for coming. <laughs> thanks, everybody. Hope to see you next month. Real quick, I, I just wanted to m make some opportunity for serendipity. Whoever uh, caught that paper, can you all meet by the drums back here? And is there anyone here named Penny? Penny? No? Okay, well, if the word penny or the name penny means something to you, come see me afterwards. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Creative Mornings, for Josh, for everyone who had coffee. Help me figure this out. Dude, I loved it. Thanks for having me. <laughs>